Hi, Eric Rhodes here from Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazines. I hope you're taking this time to watch these videos and grow as an artist. Today, I've got a great one for you. Michael Mettler in figure drawing in the Renaissance tradition. This guy's like a modern day Da Vinci. Enjoy. My name is Michael Mettler. I teach figure drawing among other things and in the next few hours I'm going to attempt to show you everything I know. Uh, I wish I could show you everything I've forgotten but then that video would be about uh, a week long. So um, we're going to start with uh, just a general discussion about life drawing and I'm going to use the little acronym LIFE. Uh, so the L will be for language, the I is for intent, the F is for form, and the E is for expression. And starting with language, uh, this is a whole new language that, uh, that artists have to learn, or the draftsman has to learn. We have a verbal language, which of course are letters, uh, words, sentences, paragraphs, stories, uh, novels, etc. But our language uh, for the artist is based on points, lines, planes, forms, images, and compositions. So uh, we're going to discuss all that and uh, individually, and then we will move on to intent. There are five levels of intent, uh, the first level being imitation. We all start drawing what we see. The second level is intellect. Uh, we try to get our brain involved in the process and we're looking for information uh, to use in our drawing. It's very hard to, very difficult to draw something we don't know anything about. Might even be impossible to do it well. The third part of this is um, interpretation and in, by interpretation uh, we're really talking about selection and deciding on the most important elements that we want to include in our drawing uh, and the ones that we desire to leave out. So we, we're doing a, we're going through a selective process to choose the best elements uh, to show the viewer, to give the viewer the, the information that we want them to have. The fourth uh, category is uh, uh, intuition and intuition really is uh, using our subconscious mind uh, where intellect would be using our conscious mind uh, intuition is using our subconscious mind and if we're going to use our subconscious mind we have to have a great deal of material in there to draw on so we go through a lot of, uh, of process in terms of doing repetitive drawings uh, to, um, to learn something so well that uh, we really don't have to think about it as we do it so our subconscious mind uh, in essence can guide our hand without our conscious mind uh, getting involved. So that's the uh, intuitive process. The last item in the in, of intent is imagination. And imagination basically is about uh, invention. Uh, and it's being able to um, use all our skill sets um, and hopefully the one skill set that's the uh, separates all master draftsmen from uh, those who we will call non-master draftsmen is that they know the figure uh, verbatim and they can draw it in any position uh, without a model. Of course you get a lot more with the model in terms of the subtleties of the pose and etc but they have the capability of drawing hands in any position, arms in any position 
So if they have a pose where the hand doesn't quite work, then they're able to change the position of the hands. In other words, they can, uh, I always say, they sent their hands to charm school. Uh, you know, this, this for instance, uh, never looks like a hand. This never looks like a hand. Uh, almost no master artist has ever tried to draw a hand or paint a hand in those positions because they are not hand-like. So we have to invent another hand to uh, insert in there. Now we can certainly move the model or we can move side to side slightly to get a, a better view of it. But uh, that's where imagination comes into play. And when I use imagination, I use that with memory uh, sort of interchangeable. Uh, those are the uh, uh, five uh, items, uh, categories of intent. Uh, then we move on to form. We all uh, know the basic forms. I like to start with the cube because I think that's the most descriptive form because it has height, width, and depth, and uh, it's the easiest form to project into space. Then before I get to the sphere, I like to uh, look at the cylinder, and I really see the sphere uh, uh, as a cylinder on end. Uh, also, the cone is a derivative of that. Uh, I'm moving back to the cube. Uh, we have as derivatives of that uh, pyramids and uh, uh, tetrahedrons. So those are the form units that we deal with. Uh, I'm going to discuss them uh, more in detail when we, when we get to the drawing process or the gravity section of this program. Um, but for now, let's just say that uh, th those suffice. suffice. Um, I think Cezanne said uh, sphere, cube, and cone. Um, but we'll add, we'll add to and subtract from uh, his uh, uh, assessment. Now let's move into uh, expression, the last part of our life uh, acronym, the E part. Uh, expression reverts back to intent, and expression involves intellect and intuition. And intellect is knowing, uh, I intuition is feeling. So we are trying to meld those two together and come up with an expressive uh, idiom for our viewer, and it's very, very difficult to do. If we all knew how to do that, uh, we would do it every time, but it's, it's uh, that seamless uh, melding of uh, intellect and intuition is what artists refer to as the zone. And we know when we're in it, or, or we know when we were in it, and we don't know how we got there usually, and we don't know how to get in and out of it at will, so it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing when it happens, and uh, that's when most creative work happens. And Unfortunately, uh, as an instructor, what, what happens is um, you aren't able to relate that aspect of your process because you're not quite sure how that really happens, but you try to lead up to it and lead the, the uh, student into that situation. Uh, and they just have to get there on their own like everybody else. But uh, you try to give them the uh, information and, and skill sets and tools to, uh, to be able to uh, succeed once they get into that zone. But uh, like I said, uh, it's, uh, it's rare. Most uh, masters uh, probably only do you know, half a dozen real masterpieces in their life, and the reason is they, they just can't get in the zone every time. Now we're going to uh, continue with our discussion of uh, the LIFE acronym. Uh, I'm going to do a, a few diagrams and drawings to uh, help with this, but uh, we have uh, language, of course, we have intent, we have form, and we have expression. We're going to start with language because we are learning a new language. We're going to discard the verbal language of uh, letters. Um, which we've grown up with, but we have uh, this will get a little easier to see as I put it in here, but we've grown up with the verbal language. Which is based on letter forms. Uh, which actually are very beautiful in themselves. Uh, certainly uh, in the Chinese language, they are all part of the golden section. But uh, 
They were also, uh, when Dewar uh, developed his alphabet, uh, he used that type of golden section geometry to create his letter forms. And let's just say this is an A for the word apple. Uh, and it's all based on a geometric formula. So it's not, uh, in terms of creating letter forms, it's not totally different from how we draw. And as a matter of fact, my lettering uh, includes uh, each aspect, in other words, a vertical, horizontal um, line, and uh, uh, I don't have any diagonals or, or curved lines in there, but uh, uh, I do here, and you can see that I'm using all of our basic uh, strokes uh, that we use for a, a visual language. You're going to See me do this a lot. I like to, I like to smear things. I'm not a tidy artist per se. Um, so this is our, our verbal language, which uh, has to do with letters, uh, words, um, sentences, uh, stories, um, or sentences, paragraphs, stories, and uh, a novel or two. Um, we don't, as artists, uh, have much information from that because the word apple, for instance. Um, says round red thing, uh, basically, and doesn't give you much more information. So we have to have a visual language which is just totally unrelated. Um, as a matter of fact, I wouldn't call it a, a language at all. I would just uh, say that we need to learn um, uh, the visual universe uh, so that we can function as artists. And that is really based on, uh, I'm going to use the model, give me a, give me a side uh, pose, for, please. Uh, and turn a little bit toward me, your upper body, just nah, not quite that much, and then put your uh, arm behind your back like we did before. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to do, uh, do a very simple drawing here of this model. And we have a point, which is a, a line on end. In other words, uh, a point is a line on end, and as that line turns, uh, it reveals, uh, as that point turns, it reveals the line, the length of the line. So we start at point A, and we turn our line uh, to its uh, ending point at point B. So a line, actually, is the edge of a plane. Lines don't actually exist in nature. Points do. Uh, you know, all you have to do is look at the bottom of a birdcage or look at... Um, uh, a leopard or uh, any animal that has spots on it. So points exist, but lines don't, don't exist in nature. So we, as artists, create a lot of uh, lines to um, satisfy our basic needs and, and to create the forms that we, that we want to create. Uh, so we're going to say that, uh, once again, a line is the edge of a plane. It only exists to be an edge of a plane because it, uh, it doesn't uh, have a function in nature, uh, or it doesn't exist in nature. And a plane exists to be the edge of a form, or the skin of a form. So we have point, line, plane, form. And then as we progress along here, we go point to point, point to point, point to point, uh, then we have a curved line that's going point to point. We have cross sections that go point to point. We have the, our legs go down to our knee, point to point. So it's our job really to kind of uh, get, get into a 
process where we're making all of our visual language as interesting as possible for our viewer. And I'll carry this out a little bit further. Uh, and it's all of these point-to-point -point, uh, relationships that create planes and planes that create forms and forms that create images. So when I combine these basic form units, uh, as you see, we start to get a nice image of an apple. That was humor. This is actually a person. So that's our visual language. So I'm going to continue on with this uh, and discuss this a little bit more because we have um, uh, the second aspect we're dealing with here is intent. And we have five levels of intent. First, first uh, level is that we're drawing what we see. And that's where we all start out. Uh, we draw things. We learn to draw things that look like things. and. Uh, we usually start out on the edges of things uh, and do um, contours of things. Uh, and then as we progress, we uh, work more from the inside out. But uh, that's our starting point. Uh, it's uh, also known as duplicating or copying. But we're, we're referencing our image of the world uh, as we th think it exists uh, or as we are seeing it. So we're actually drawing what we see. But so the second part of intent, there are like five levels. The second part of that uh, really deals with um, intellect uh, and using, using our mind uh, along with our eyes. Uh, so uh, if we're looking at something, uh, we are not necessarily seeing it until we engage our brain and d determine what we're looking at. So uh, first we have an imitation, then we have intellect. Intellect also is synonymous with information. What we are actively pursuing here is visual information that we can use in our drawing. You really have a hard time drawing anything that you don't know anything about, so you're trying to become informed. I usually have my uh, students walk around the model so that they can see the pose in, in either 180 or 360 and really understand the pose because you only see about 20% uh, of it from one position, uh, if that and you really don't understand the pose all that well. So uh, you're looking for information. You're looking for mass conceptions. So that's the uh, intellectual part of this. And then we interpret uh, that. Uh, interpretation becomes the third part of this. And we interpret uh, what we're looking at. And we decide what we want to put in and what we want to leave out. So interpretation is another way of saying uh, selection. So perhaps we decide, hey, uh, yeah, we know these uh, lines are here, but they're kind of confusing, so I'm going to leave these lines out. You know, I'm going to, in this situation, I'm going back and taking them out, but I could have left them out in the beginning to start with. So uh, the interpretation really is the selection process. What's useful to your drawing and what's not so useful to your drawing. So. Uh, that gets us uh, to the fourth thing, which is intuition. And intuition is, uh, as you're seeing, uh, uh, to some degree, uh, you know, I'm drawing the model, and to some degree I'm uh, drawing uh, some structural aspects of the model that I have in my uh, knowledge vault. So uh, that's the uh, intuitive part where you really are using uh, your knowledge base to guide your hand uh, so that your conscious mind can be, uh, to the, actually your subconscious mind to guide your hand so your conscious mind can get involved in other activities. So the uh, idea of, uh, of having a lot of intuitive information um, is that uh, it frees you up uh, to really concentrate and, and, uh, on new things and to learn new things. So if you're going through the same activity, every drawing that you do, without relying on some intuitive information that you've absorbed uh, from past experience, 
you're really solving the same problems over and over and over and over, and you really don't leave yourself time to investigate new avenues of information. So that's uh, the uh, intent part of this, uh, which we've now gotten into intuition, and then we'll go to invention. And invention is the aspect of this, uh, just to say that this uh, pose is not necessarily working for me. So I'm going to invent an arm. And a hand. And a thumb. And so then I can come back and refine this. But uh, you'll see on many, many old master drawings, you will note that uh, around uh, a lot of Michelangelo drawings or, or Rubens or um, uh, all of the uh, Quattrocento uh, masters, um, there are often like additional feet or additional hands that uh, uh, I would venture to say uh, were totally invented. Um, they may have asked the model to change that, or they may have actually been added after the model was gone. But they certainly knew how to draw those other hands uh, without uh, having to have a model to do that from. So uh, let me just uh, start finessing this slightly. Um, that's our five levels of uh, intent. Um, one being imitation, two being uh, intellect, three being interpretation, four being intuition, and five being imagination. And imagination doesn't have to be a scary word because we can't imagine something that we haven't experienced. So uh, it's something that's part of our memory bank and we just have to be able to uh, access it uh, when the time arises. So uh, let's just say that uh, we want to put this uh, other arm kind of back here on our hip in the back. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's decide that we're going to uh, put this one leg back here instead of in front. Now, I use uh, this uh, three-tier system. You note that I'm using kind of a um, uh, harder, uh, this happens to be a, a Rembrandt Carrier Pastel. Unfortunately, they, uh, you need to request them a lot so they are available in this country, right? They currently, currently are not, but you can get a, you can get a nice set from uh, England made by Royal Talons, Rembrandt, uh, C-A-R-R-E. I believe it's Carré, but uh, my French is uh, uh, not, not as good as my uh, native tongue. Uh, so going back to this, my first way of subtracting is the paper towel. This happens to be Viva Advantage. Please, Viva, if you're listening, please send me three or four cases of this. And secondly, I'm using a chamois. So this is in the back. I don't really have to accentuate that as much. Uh, this, this arm's still kind of a little strange, but uh, I, I want a shoulder involved here. Um, let's make this uh, young lady a dancer. So there's a little invention that's, uh, no, actually it's on the model, so we won't have to invent that. Um, so I think you're starting to get the point, but let me pull out a few more of these uh, construction lines, and then I will add just a, a little more um, information in terms of value. As I go through this process, you will note that um, I oftentimes will throw in value very early in the game. Let's wrap this around the other side. Um, and I like to get all the players, uh, all everybody in, in the game. You know, this is, um, we, we're bringing all the players off the bench and, and letting them participate uh, early on. Um, 
So our basic form units uh, in terms of mass conception, uh, you know, if, uh, I'm starting here with um, uh, doing Bridgman in reverse. Uh, you know, I have a triangle for the foot. I have a cube or a cuboid form for the lower leg or for the ankle. Then for the lower leg, I have a triangular shape. And then for the upper leg, I have a, well, then for the knee, I have another cube. Then for the upper leg, I have a, a cylindrical form. For the uh, rib cage, I have a, uh, a cube or a cuboid box form. Um, and in the middle, uh, uh, this can either be kind of an egg shape. Uh, so this all mass conceptions. You have a cylinder for the neck. Uh, Bridgman uses a cube. I use a sphere to balance on top. So we're using all of our uh, basic form units, our, our mass conceptions, to create the center part of this leg becomes the front part of the lower leg. So you have a offset back here. Comes in, you have your knee falls into that situation. And then once again, you can either put this block going down to the, I like to put it all the way to the floor and then build my triangle off of that just so I get that stabilized. This is a block form that's sitting on top of the uh, leg. Uh, you know, uh, I use um, a uh, egg form for this. Uh, block, uh, Bridgman uses a block form, but I, I use this um, egg form for the rib cage and the, the block form for the pelvis. Um, I spent a great deal of time with uh, Mr. Bridgman and Mr. Hale and, uh, and, and probably all of, all of the uh, other players that, uh, that you all are familiar with. Uh, I've tried to take from them what works for me and uh, um, but I try it anyway. I, you know, I always try it to see if there's uh, something beneficial. Um, I really try to force myself out of my comfort zone so that uh, uh, I learn something. I mean, the, 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 the process of getting better, I think, is, is, is being willing to learn and being willing to get out of your co comfort zone. I think there's nothing worse uh, for an artist, particularly early on in their career, to get accolades for uh, something and uh, not, uh, uh, you know, being afraid to give that up, you know, so don't be afraid to learn. Learning is not a dangerous thing. So uh, that's the whole idea of combining these form units. And uh, the expression thing, uh, I would just kind of uh, uh, talk about uh, as I'm cleaning up this drawing a little bit. The third thing that I use to really get back to the paper. And you see what I've done here is I've created my, uh, this, this is a, actually I just, how I, I just showed you how to do this and then I didn't uh, kick it back enough. So this is the center part of that. So my leg needs to be kicked back more than I've done it here. Um, don't be afraid to make changes. One thing that's a serious mistake when you're drawing is to totally erase the line that you feel is a mistake. Uh, it's not a mistake, of course, because nobody's ever drawn that line but you. So uh, there's no precedent that it can be a mistake. I mean, it's the first time it's ever been done. You may not like it. You might want to do a better line, but to help you do a better line, leave a little bit of the ghost of the line that you're taking out so that you won't put the same line back in again because I've seen beginners do that uh, and even experienced artists do that numerous times. They will take a line out because they don't like the angle or they don't like uh, you know, something about it and they will put the same line back in because they don't have the reference from uh, to go back from. So. Uh, don't be afraid to change. I'm, I'm very uh, aware all the time of this uh, floor plan. I put my models on a stage. I will talk about this a lot as we progress along. But I put them on a stage so I know where center stage is. I know where uh, down stage is. I know where upstage is. I also know where my notional space fits around this model so that I can use negative 
shapes to give myself a lot of information as well. We're, we're, we're going to talk about all these things individually. The fourth way to uh, really get uh, s some form to start bouncing out of this drawing is to just really throw in some, if my light source is Rembrandt lighting from over here, uh, then I basically know that I've got uh, some things that are going to be picking up some light and I don't really have to be too uh, exacting as I throw that in. I like to work, by the way, uh, leaving myself room to put in a highlight, a white highlight or a lighter highlight and uh, also put into a, a darker accent. And so uh, this is uh, what, I'm, what I do. And uh, like I said, I, I leave room for the potential to put in some some brighter notes of color. I also, when I say accents, I leave myself uh, room to put in some darker accents as well. So. so expression really uh, is getting back here to intent and really looking at your conscious mind, which is uh, knowing, and your subconscious mind, which uh, is uh, feeling uh, what the model is doing. And to the feeling aspect of this, I often use the word empathy instead of expression, but empathy is kind of misconstrued uh, to, to get into sentimentality or you know, uh, how the model is feeling. I'm interested in how the model's feeling. It's not my concern uh, for, for my drawing at all. My concern on my drawing in terms of empathy is understanding. In other words, having a feel for what the model's doing having a feel for the time-space uh, continuum of the model, what she might have been doing prior to uh, step out of that pose and step back into it, just step out, now, now step back into that pose, what she might have been doing prior to that uh, pose and what she might be doing after that pose, what would be her next movement after that pose. So I'm interested in understanding where she is in that time-space continuum. Uh, that's the uh, kind of kinetic part of it, the movement part of it. I'm also interested in the universal truths uh, in terms of her uh, line of gravity and the balance, uh, what should be from the pit of the neck, you know, down uh, somewhere around the ankle. So empathy uh, it has two aspects to the empathy I'm talking about. The kinetic aspect, which is trying to determine the uh, time and space relationship of the model to her surround. The other part of that is um, uh, the empathy with the universal uh, truths or the universal uh, qualities that, uh, uh, that the model's uh, involved with, and uh, that has to do with uh, the uh, weight, uh, the balance, uh, uh, and just really the total rhythmic harmony of the model in space. So these are uh, things that you feel, you know, you relate to, uh, and you have to relate to them. I often have my students walk around the model and view it from all directions because, quite frankly, you don't really see the model from one position. If you come in and you sit down and you start drawing the model, you really do not understand the pose and you do not understand the dimensionality of the model. The model is 360. It's in the round. We see, actually, we see two-dimensionally. We only see with uh, uh, a, a kind of a bifocal kind of effect, which means we're not really just seeing an edge or a contour, we're seeing like a little double edge, but we're not seeing, we're not seeing uh, certainly nothing three-dimensionally. So the only thing we know about three-dimensional is what we know about our experience, about walking around the model. The LIFE uh, acronym uh, has to do with uh, language, intent, form, and empathy or expression. Uh, Language is uh, something that we are going to spend a long time, uh, you know, making the transition from a, a verbal language, which we've been using our whole life, to a visual language, which we are going to have to learn uh, anew. Uh, and uh, it's, not, uh, it's not easy to get to Carnegie Hall, as they say. So uh, have, it's, like, it's actually like learning a new foreign language. It's foreign. It's, it's not going to be really uh, that apparent uh, early on. Uh, intent uh, is something that you grow into because we all start with imitation, uh, drawing things uh, that look like things, uh, copying in essence or duplicating. 
uh, then we try to broaden that out. We try to gain a, a knowledge base that's uh, a little uh, more in depth and uh, we try to understand more about form as we uh, move into uh, uh, this arena and uh, uh, that uh, becomes a whole uh, study in, its, in, in and of itself and uh, uh, hopefully you didn't like uh, sleep through geometry uh, when you took it uh, in lower school but uh, uh, if you did you're going to have you're going to have time to make up for it now so um, then of course the E uh, really the, the the feeling part of this and where we try to combine what we know with what we feel uh, and what and what we feel actually on a uh, rational basis of, in terms of what the model is doing not what we feel about uh, what we th think the model uh, you know what she's happy about or sad about it has very little to do with that it has to do really like I said with the universal truths of weight balance gravity etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, hopefully uh, this uh, lays a good foundation for what we're going to talk about and uh, we will proceed with uh, the next part of it which is plan and plan deals with uh, P for proportion L for landmarks a for angles and alignments and uh, N for negative spaces or notons which uh, gets us well on our journey into the uh, drawing process. Have you ever gazed in wonder at the beautiful figure drawings created by Botticelli, Caravaggio, Michelangelo, or Da Vinci, and thought to yourself, I'd love to be able to do that. There's no doubt that learning how to draw the human form is a priceless skill for any artist because it's the foundation of all art. But what if you can take it to a higher level? What if you could master the drawing techniques of the old masters? The key is having the right mentor to help guide your hand and give you principles to simplify the process. Michael Mentler has been called a modern-day Leonardo da Vinci. His drawings and sketchbooks are priceless masterworks. Master artist Michael Mentler's teaching skill breaks the drawing process down into easy-to-understand steps. So you want to do this exercise with some gusto. It's called gesture for a reason. Uh, it is not called find the line of action or find the posture or find anything. It's called gesture, and gesture means exactly that. You're trying to get the action in relation to the pull of gravity. In his all-new exclusive instructional video, world-class figure artist Michael Mentler shares his step-by-step -step approach to creating stunning figure drawings in the Renaissance tradition. You'll discover how to work with the forms that make up the human body how to establish the correct proportions of the head, arms, torso, hips, and more, the secret to drawing the head from multiple angles, and how to draw features like the eye sockets, cranium, cheekbones, mouth, and nose. You'll also learn how to use a wireframe to draw the human body from multiple angles, how to use gravity, light, shadow, and movement to your advantage. How to tap into your intuition, giving yourself the freedom to grow and learn with each drawing you create. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I hope it's a big benefit to, uh, to your pursuit of, uh, of your career and uh, whatever your uh, goals are as an artist. Whether you're a complete beginner or an experienced artist, this all-new training will help you discover how to master the skill of creating beautiful figure drawings with a Renaissance flair. This is a skill that will serve you for years to come and give you the foundational principles to draw the human figure with elegance and fill your sketchbooks with masterful drawings. 
figure drawing in the Renaissance tradition with Michael Mentler is now available on video. Reserve your copy today. When we had Michael Mentler in for his video shoot, it was a really terrific week. He left the week by giving me a page from his coveted drawing book and it's framed it in the house and one of my favorite things, I love the way he draws. He's also one of the most intelligent guys I've ever met. You're gonna love the interview. If you wanna hear more about his video, go to lilyartvideo.com. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plein Air Magazine, and Artists on Art Magazine. And today in the studio, we're honored to have um, just an absolute brilliant artist, Michael Mentler. Michael has been called the Leonardo da Vinci of our time, the modern da Vinci. Uh, he was called that by Richard Schmidt, and a lot of other artists agree with that, so welcome. Thank you. No pressure. No pressure, no. Yeah. So. Uh, where did this Leonardo thing come from? Because your, your sketches have this, this feel, um, your look, I have to say, you kind of got the look down. What's the story behind all that? Well, uh, it was very unintended. Uh, it hadn't even really occurred to me until uh, Richard uh, Schmidt looked at my sketchbooks and uh, uh, I wasn't there when he, when he saw them. They were in somebody else's uh, possession, but uh, he'd looked through them and uh, actually Dan Gerhardt's gave them to him to look through. And uh, they searched me out at this uh, conference, and uh, he basically said, "I want to congratulate you. You know, you know you're a modern-day Leonardo." And um, uh, quite humbly, it, it, it really brought tears to my eyes. Um, but I had not patterned uh, anything after Leonardo. Uh, he's actually somebody that I had uh, referenced not a whole lot uh, in my career in terms of copying old masters or. or uh, studying old masters, um, but certainly the paper and uh, the the uh, earth colored bistra inks and that sort of thing. I can see, I can see where where one would uh, go to that uh, uh, could make that leap. Uh, the the other way that people can make that leap is that I write a lot of stuff out in uh, uh, my handwriting in the uh, as notes uh, to myself. Um, but initially, they were never intended to, to be for public view. They were really pretty much just for my edification. Uh, so um, the fact that somebody else appreciated them or, or liked them really was, uh, came as quite a shock to me. Well, I had the, uh, the pleasure this week of looking through your sketchbooks, and I couldn't put them down. I, I wanted to take a copy of every page because it's such a, a wonderful learning instrument. And, and as you know, I even said to you, at some point you need to publish your sketchbooks, and then you told me that you have a book. Tell me about the book. Some postings that I did online and some of the people that had looked at my drawings called me the bone doctor because I did a lot of anatomical sketches and a, a lot of uh, artistic anatomy. And so they kind of put that handle uh, <laughs> Uh, next to my name, and so this is the Book of Bones, Volume 1, which uh, is 180 pages long, and it has to do mainly with uh, the figure sketches uh, in my sketchbooks. There's 7,500 pages of sketchbook drawings at this point, uh, so this is uh, Book 1 of at least three. So I am very curious. I'd like to kind of roll back the time and understand how this all came about because to have 7,500 pages of sketchbooks means you've been doing it for a long, long time. Why don't we kind of go back to the early beginnings. What are your first recollections of art? My first recollections of art uh, were when I went over to a babysitter's uh, house and I discovered uh, the Esquire magazines uh, that her husband had collected and all of the Vargas drawings in the magazines, and I was very young. And uh, I think at that point in time, I, I knew I had to be an artist. It was just the, the only thing I ever desired to be from that point on. I thought uh, Vargas was in Playboy. He was later. Ah. Uh, he was later. And I start, he started out in um, um, Esquire. And uh, just a little aside, do you know he never sent anything in that wasn't totally nude? 
No. Uh, Esquire and Playboy both had artists like retouch stuff on the, on the models. But uh, at, a, at a young age, I started drawing at a young age, and my mom was very encouraging uh, to me. Uh, my dad didn't to totally understand what it was all about, but my mom uh, had a creative vent and, uh, and encouraged my drawing. And uh, uh, so I spent a lot of time in my room drawing at a very, very early age. Where were you living at the time? We were in central Illinois, uh, a town called Jacksonville. It's about 20,000 people. Uh, so when we build the plaque, what was the address of the house in Jacksonville? Uh, the address of the house was uh, 1011 West Lafayette, Jacksonville, Illinois. So um, you, your young age, like many of us, you're sketching, mm -hmm. but you took it to a higher level at that time, or did you get some instruction? Well, I got some instruction. I, I really got very lucky because uh, in the seventh grade, um, I had a, uh, an art teacher, uh, and her husband uh, happened to be the chair of the local art department uh, uh, for McMurray College, which was in Jacksonville. And so she kind of put me together with her husband because she uh, thought uh, that, or could see that I had aspirations in that direction. And uh, he kind of mentored me at a very, very early age. So I took a lot of uh, uh, college courses all the way through junior high school, uh, you know, through high school. And, and, and certainly in the summer, I always took like painting classes or drawing classes in the summer. And all of the uh, humanities and art history and everything they had available pretty much. So uh, that, was a, that was just uh, being at the right place at the right time and having somebody that uh, you know, thought enough to, to put me in touch with her husband. And uh, I had teachers at, um, at uh, my schools that, you know, that were okay with that. So, you know, they would let me uh, take like study hall and other classes away from my standard school curriculum and go over to the college. Of course, it was so, it was so far away, about a mile, you know. So you were taking college courses during high school. Absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, you and ended- for, And for college credits. And for college credits. And then did you end up going to college? Uh, I, I did end up going to college. I went to uh, Layton uh, uh, College of Art in Milwaukee. Uh, at the time, it was uh, in the top 10 art schools in the country. And then I transferred to Washington University in St. Louis, which was also in the top 10 uh, art schools in the country. And I was fortunate enough to have some uh, really, really outstanding instructors. So this was a time, what year would that have been when you were in college? Well, I was in college in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. So this is a time when the whole modernism movement was very, very strong and, and really uh, had kind of taken hold of most of the world. Was it uh, difficult to find a place to learn how to draw or paint traditionally at the time? Well, the schools that I went to still had a very, very strong uh, two-year foundation program, and the foundation instructors were all traditional artists. Uh, you know, so you know we did uh, traditional uh, design, traditional composition, traditional figure drawing, tra traditional drawing. Actually, we didn't do figure drawing until my sophomore year, but uh, I had a. a a guy that just retired by the name of Stanley Tasker, who was a, a, a Scottish guy that spoke with quite an accent, and he had this um, uh, quadre of, uh, of blowfish and all of these great things in these historic cabinets, and we used to just take them out and set them up and draw. And I can remember, I remember that vividly. That was so much fun to be in his class. You went to, to university. You did the two-year program in Milwaukee, mm -hmm. and then what happened? Did you make art your career at that point? Well, I'd already decided I was going to be an artist, uh, you know, a long time before that. Right. So uh, I really never ever considered another profession. Um, of course, I was a big jock uh, in high school and college as well. So uh, I had to give that up uh, after the foundation program because the studio classes were so time consuming. So what, what was your first entry into being a professional artist at that time? Well, I, mean, I had my first one-man show when I was 14. So, oh, you, you know, did? So, so uh, you know, right away I, you know, kind of was headed that direction. But um, uh, I worked in, uh, you know, commercial art studios and, uh, you know, did uh, design work for printing companies and uh, uh, did a number of uh, odds and, you know, art-related jobs all, all the way through college. So would you have been considered an illustrator? 
Uh, I've actually done uh, just about everything. I've done graphic design, illustration. Of course, uh, back then we did all the uh, mechanical art by hand, so uh, I have like exacto knife cuts uh, to prove it. Uh, actually, I have a few on the top of my foot where it rolls off the drawing board and you can't move. It just, it's going straight down and you just watch it. You know, you, it's a terrible feeling, really. <laughs> <laughs> So you leave Milwaukee, and then where did you end up? Well, I went to Washington U in St. Louis, and uh, you know I transferred there, and uh, uh, they had a very, very fine program. Their uh, foundation program was outstanding. I had a, uh, a figure structure uh, instructor by the name of uh, Barry Shockman, who uh, was a uh, Rico LeBrun protege, and uh, actually a lifelong friend with Rico LeBrun, and, uh, very, very proficient draftsman, and I learned a great deal from him. Uh, I had some uh, uh, people that actually, uh, I, had a, I had three professors actually that went to the Bauhaus, so they had very, very just strong uh, design, uh, uh, strong design uh, backgrounds. But I'd, I'm not sure that I actually was getting that at the time, but uh, I know that they worked me very, very hard. Uh, I had a professor by the name of Werner Drevis, and uh, he spoke very broken English. Uh, but uh, I asked him one time, he, he went, you're, you're working very hard. You're working very hard. You're working very hard. And I went, well, you must have worked very hard, too, uh, at the Bauhaus. And there was a very long pause, and he looked me straight in the eye, and he went, no, no, we drank a lot of beer. <laughs> so that's, um, you know, that's my Werner Drevis story. But uh, So uh, Arthur Osver uh, really was a, uh, early on, uh, pretty big in the abstract expressionist world, even though his work was very representational. I mean, if you looked at it, you saw factories and smokestacks and uh, it uh, didn't uh, venture off into total abstraction, so there was a kind of a transitional uh, figuration there. Uh, but they had a lot of uh, very, very good instructors. About half of uh, the Washington University graduating class went to uh, Yale's graduate program, so uh, we were uh, the main, main source for their uh, uh, MFA programs for a number of years. Well, that says a lot because they were pretty picky. They were pretty, yeah, they were pretty picky. Um, a lot of my friends went. I, I ended up not going because I, I was uh, uh, encumbered with family and uh, they didn't give me enough of a stipend to go. So I, I ended up staying at, at Washington U for grad school. All right. And then what happened after that? Well, after that, uh, you know, I, I had mentioned that uh, along the way I'd worked for advertising agencies. Uh, that was paying pretty well. That was, uh, and I was, I was instructing at Washington U, but that was paying not so much. So um, uh, I worked for advertising agencies uh, part-time, and then I took a full-time job with, uh, advertising agencies, uh, with advertising agencies, and I spent uh, decades in that business. And uh, that's probably the reason I can afford now to be a fine artist, is that uh, I uh, made enough money doing that that I can relax a little bit. Now you, at some point, moved to Dallas, Texas, which is your home now, and you've been there for, what, 25, 30 years? I've been there uh, almost 40 years. I've been there since 1974. Uh, my uh, current wife, uh, when we were dating, ran off with a Texan, and I decided that uh, that wasn't uh, that was that didn't set well with me. So I decided to uh, chase her, and it all worked out. And so um, you, you worked in advertising in Dallas. Mm -hmm. You ended up with your own agency, your wife and yourself owning mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, what, what kind of things were you doing? Were you doing strategic thinking? Were you doing creative? Were you actually physically doing the graphics or the design? Well, I, you know, I was always hands-on with a lot of the graphics and the design and uh, did uh, uh, a lot of uh, film work, a lot of film production, uh, even some film direction. Uh, in the beginning, I, I would go to uh, uh, either coast with a producer, and after a while I did my own production, so uh, um, I spent most of the time in my, my latter uh, years with the big agencies uh, really, you know, doing, doing commercials, uh, film, uh, you know, a few documentary kind of pieces of work, but... Uh, so when you, when you 
are, are working that hard. I know the advertising business. I know that it's uh, uh, a lot of deadlines, a lot of long days. Uh, it, it's pretty much thankless. There's a lot of reward to it, but mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're working very hard on your commercial art. Mm -hmm. How did you find time or did you find time to start focusing on your fine art? Well, uh, I didn't really spend a whole lot of time painting. Uh, you know, I would paint some on weekends, and uh, every time we would move and I had another wall to fill up, I would do a, a, a fairly large painting. Uh, but my hand was constantly moving, so uh, in some regards, you know, uh, the mind-eye coordination, it doesn't really matter whether you're drawing a, uh, a beer can or if you're <laughs> drawing a, a, a silver chalice, it doesn't really matter. So. so your advice to artists is always be moving, always be drawing? Well, rhythm uh, for artists is as important as it is in dance and music. And in dance, of course, they do stretching exercises and they have a repertoire they go through before they practice, before they uh, go on stage. Uh, the same with music, musicians practice behind stage before they go to perform. And I feel it's the same way uh, with art. I think that uh, you know, the draftsman has to have certain uh, exercises that, that, that are geared uh, as uh, uh, hand-mind coordination, you know, and I think that's very, very important. Uh, I do some uh, basic kind of geometric kinds of configurations every morning. The first thing I do in the morning, by the way, is I go to my drawing board and I sit down and I have a couple of little uh, geometric diagrams that I do and then I make a cup of coffee because I want to have the feeling that I've already started drawing before anything else happens during the day. So these geometric drawings that you're doing, uh, same ones every day just to kind of warm up? Yeah, they're, they're pretty much uh, uh, point to point, uh, line to line, you know, line to plane, plane to form kind of uh, drawings that um, uh, they're just uh, really to warm up. Uh, they're also uh, to try to get my brain and hand on, on the same page, you know. So um, uh, the first couple of lines I might put down, uh, you know, the, the, the hand's moving, but the brain's not quite attached to it yet. So, you know, the results aren't that great. So you try to get that rhythm going where everything becomes uh, intuitive and kind of... Uh, um, uh, just working out of your subconscious, you know, so instead of thinking about going from point to point, you're just going from point to point. Yeah, well, we were at dinner last night, we were talking about, you were saying that you, you always just push to the point, you never think about drawing the line, you're always just going from here to here, right. and I never really thought about that because, you know, I, when I'm trying to make an exact line, it tends to get a little bit Mm -hmm. bumpy and so I started trying that last night just by focusing on the target and just going right to the target. It's amazing how it changes the line. It does and it's, a, it's amazing uh, after doing it for a while because your first impulse is uh, how am I going to hit that point? But you have to kind of trust your mind and your hand to work together so that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to put the intellect and intuition together so that so that you can do these kinds of exercises. Um, yeah, what I really try to avoid is, uh, I mean, what we're talking about is the opposite from ske a sketched line, you know, which most people do, and a lot of professionals do it, and they do it successfully. You know, I'm not uh, uh, demeaning that method at all, but uh, for me, you know, I'm, I'm interested in really kind of getting a rhythm which requires longer strokes and, you know, more rhythmic arabesque and those kinds of things. So. so what do you think are the most important principles for somebody who's trying to figure out how to draw? Mm -hmm. um, what's the starting point? What do you recommend as a process for them to go through? Well, um, you know, the traditional process is to um, uh, really work from uh, uh, engraved plates uh, or to work from cast, uh, the actual cast, uh, but um, uh, you could take actually just uh, square wooden blocks and paint them white and set them up in front of you and then add 
Uh, they actually have sets of really nice sets of wooden blocks that you can build little houses out of and all kinds of arches and things and just put those in perspective and really start drawing just simple uh, geometric forms uh, and then graduate into uh, you know pears or apples or whatever and, and, and go buy the uh, uh, synthetic fruit and paint it white so that you're not confused with color yet and uh, uh, light it. It's, it's better in my estimation. Now, I, I think it's very valuable to work from, uh, from uh, the barred plates, particularly if you don't have access to, uh, to, to good casts or whatever. But if you do have access to uh, 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 casts, certainly use those because it's really valuable to be able to just move your head and see how the light moves across the form. And that gives you a, 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 a more sculptural understanding of what you're drawing. Uh, if you're actually working from a real three-dimensional thing because being able to walk around something uh, and, and seeing it in 360 uh, you understand it a lot. Even if you're just looking at an apple and you're seeing how that's lit from one side you, re you really kind of want to like lean one way and lean the other way and see if there's any like little plane changes in the, in the face of the apple that you might miss you know f with the naked eye uh, without doing that. So. so Okay. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, just watching that little, uh, what uh, uh, has been referred to as the little bed bug line, really, uh, of that shadow moving around a complex form uh, really tells your subconscious a whole lot about that form. We know nothing about form without experience because we see two-dimensionally. And the bed bug line, uh, for those of you who don't know, is where the dark meets the light. And in a color scenario, there's more chroma more color on that bed bug line than there is almost anywhere else, right? Correct, yes. Okay, so you're painting the fruit white and you're moving around and you're looking at the light. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to draw this. Mm -hmm. Now, what I have always understood is that if you're drawing, uh, when you're learning to draw, they put you, oftentimes they put you on these little benches so you're not moving around because if you're constantly doing this, mm -hmm. um, your drawing is going to start looking like Picasso eyes, you know, one over mm -hmm. here and one over here mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about uh, your, your process. Do you have like perfect stability in, in your head when, you're, when you're, you'd always try to go back to the same exact plane? Is your canvas always, well, you're not using canvas, you're drawing, but are, is your drawing board on the same plane, how do, how do you deal with those issues? Well, I, I really don't, uh, you know, uh, do sight size where I'm like uh, parallel to, or on the same plane with uh, uh, the, the object. Um, you know, there's always, uh, uh, even if it's just minuscule, there's always memory involved, even if you're, you know, doing sight size, there's always a smidgen of memory involved. Uh, and to measure angles with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm using more comp a more comparative method. Now, if I were, you know, really taking exact angles off of the model, I would need to be obviously parallel to, to the model. So are you doing that by holding up your, your brush or your pen and comparing the distance between one object and, and the other? And, or are you just doing that in your head? Well, I, you know, I have I work with a system called the uh, uh, cranial sternal index, which uh, uh, really kind of places uh, uh, elements of, of the figure in pretty much where they should be, and then you judge the model to see if the model differs from that uh, uh, schematic, uh, and they usually do. So you you, you adjust accordingly. And where does that come from, cranial sternal index? Uh, the uh, first I saw of it was uh, Robert Beverly Hale. And Robert Beverly Hale, of course, translated uh, Riche. And the cranial index, uh, ironically, uh, is very parallel to Riche's measurements, but Riche used the head length instead of the head width. And when you use the head width, that's a geometric solid because that's a sphere. And uh, uh, if you have a geometric solid, you uh, can put three of them in a row in perspective, and you know that that's the length of your leg, your upper leg. Uh, so I use a number uh, when you said measure this or measure that. Uh, I break 
complex things down into intervals across. In other words, you know, how, how wide is it across your arm? How far is it to uh, your sternum? How far is it from your sternum to your other arm? How wide is that arm? So I'm, I'm measuring positive and negative spaces up and down and across. And uh, uh, I have a whole series of uh, comparative things that I do in terms of uh, you know, vertical alignments and horizontal alignments and diagonal alignments. and uh, the object, uh, whether I'm successful or not, the object is that uh, when you get done, you've done enough of these comparative uh, uh, judge, judgmental uh, uh, comparisons that you know, your subconscious keeps constantly reworking these. And you know, the object is that you're not actually always having to say, okay, now I'm going to align this. You know, you're trying to get all of, all of this information into your uh, knowledge vault, uh, let's say, so that uh, it, that can communicate with your hand without uh, you actually having to really participate a whole lot. So it's, it's the subconscious part of the activity and, and hopefully that frees your conscious mind to concentrate on another element. Right, right. And you get to the point where things become second nature and so you know that every face is going to behave a certain way when the light hits it or certain things are going to fall approximately in, in certain places. So we talked earlier about the head mm -hmm. and you know one of the giant mistakes that most people when they're learning to draw the head is they put the eyes way up here somewhere sure. and the eyes are really kind of at the halfway mark on the circle. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah uh, and also uh, except for uh, uh, mothers, or, or certainly new mothers, uh, most people don't realize how big the head is looking at it from the top, you know. So that, that's, that's part of it, you know, and it, uh, the old pirate flags you used to see, you know, when you see them in the movies they're all wrong because the old pirate flags like, had, like you said, they had like the eyes were way up at the top of the skull, you know, so when you see one where the uh, the eye sockets are kind of in the right place, you know that Hollywood did that. You know, it's not uh, not authentic. You know. How do you know that? Uh, Were you a pirate? Robert Beverly Hale told me that. No. <laughs> uh, I was, yeah. Uh, what uh, What's a pirate's uh, favorite place to eat? I don't know. Arby's. Oh, Arby's, of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we digress. <laughs> What I'd like to touch on are some of your philosophies sure. uh, because I think that you have um, you, you've really done a massive amount of work in your lifetime. Uh, in just looking at the, the depth of your sketchbooks, and I only saw probably a half a dozen of them. Yeah, and they're about 72 at this point. So. Yeah, that's a lot of sketchbooks. That's a lot of sketchbooks. Yeah. So uh, why do you do this? Uh, that's, uh, I have to do it, so I mean, I, I really don't know any other way, any other way to explain that. I have some, uh, uh, learning, uh, difficulties, uh, and some focus difficulties, and so, uh, I'm very ritualistic about getting up and, uh, trying to center or ground myself, and, uh, drawing is a way to do that, so, uh, it's not choice really at this point. I mean, I've been doing it so long that it's like breathing, you know. So if I'm not doing it, I, I start gasping for air. And uh, that sounds a little bogus, but it's true. <laughs> no, I totally get that. Yeah, it's, I've yeah. often said a day without painting is like a day without oxygen. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, which is tough for me because I have, a, have to go to a job every day. Yeah, I know, I know. And you did that too. I did that for uh, decades, so. Uh, I was fortunate enough, my wife threw me out of the uh, business uh, and uh, we had a, a corporate takeover and she took it over. So I, uh, I've got to paint the last 20 years full time and she's allowed me the space to uh, really kind of uh, explore my craft. So, so we, we know a lot about your drawings. I'm not sure we know a lot about your paintings. Mm -hmm. uh, what? Are your paintings uh, larger representations of your drawings? Are they much more uh, finished? What What would the well? I mean, I do I do a couple of kinds of things uh, in terms of painting. I do some uh, indirect paintings that that I do that are very uh, realistic, that are that are, that are a lot of glazing, and uh, 
uh, multi-day efforts, and uh, then I also do some things that are uh, uh, based on my sketchbooks, but, uh, but more of my diagrammatic uh, proportional drawings, and uh, they're uh, uh, somewhat deconstructed. I mean, you can still tell that it's three figures. I always do three figures, a trade grazi. I do a front view, a side view, and a back view. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm using atmospheric perspective. I'm zoning them, you know, zone one, zone two, zone three. They're different sizes. So there are a lot of classical elements to, to what I do, even though uh, uh, I would consider them tra more transitional than, than realist or modern. They're not, you know, they, I certainly don't, uh, uh, they're certainly not abstract, and, you know, at least in my mind. You know. So, what do you want the world to remember you for? Boy, I just want them to remember. I, you know, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Just remember me. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe my next series of paintings. Uh, I'm not sure what they are, but uh, that would be nice if they remembered me for them anyway. So, does it weird you out a little bit this comparison to Da Vinci? I know that you. you yeah, it actually it does. I mean, uh, you know, I'm. I'm uh, I'm very humbled by it. Uh, uh, considering the source, though, I, 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 I really took it as, a, as quite a compliment. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I, I wouldn't have gone there. Uh, I'm just not, that's not my, <laughs> it's not the way I look at myself. But I, I can see the uh, comparison in that uh, I see that he was extremely inquisitive about stuff. And, uh, uh, I wake up every day knowing I'm going to learn something. Not hoping I will learn something, but knowing I'm going to learn something. And usually uh, I, I have to get up because Lolly gets up uh, anywhere from like three to, if, if I'm lucky, quarter to five. And I think I'm going back to sleep, but once I'm awake, uh, my mind kind of clicks in and uh, usually it's something about drawing or something about something I'm working on and I have this like what seems like a brilliant idea, kind of in a half a dream, and I'm going like, I need to get up and try that. And of course, one out of ten times it works, it actually works, but uh, uh, at least, you know, uh, it's, it's better than just laying there and not going back to sleep. So. Well, I woke up at four o'clock this morning, and I looked out the window, and the lights were on in the guest cabin, uh -huh. and the world-famous artist cabin, as I like to call it, uh -huh. and uh, I thought, He's in there drawing. Yeah. So when you have accumulated 72 sketchbooks, right. probably a couple hundred pages each, and no, well, they're not that big, but you know, they're because they're uh, they're cover weight paper, but you know, well, yeah, because they're, they're, they're two sides, so yeah, they're they're like 150 pages. And there's and there's lots and lots and lots of drawings on most sure, pages. Sure, sure. How do you look at drawing differently once you've accumulated that sense of knowledge? Is it is it just become completely second nature? Are you able to kind of go on autopilot? Are you uh, mentally engaged in every one? What? How does it feel once you've got that level of experience? Um, well, uh, you kind of go through periods where you are a little detached from it, and you don't kind of relate to it as well and then all of a sudden you seem to get back into the zone and uh, the work uh, you know, gets exciting for you and you can't wait to get back and do the next page the next day. But I mean it, ha it has its ups and downs. You know I, I went through a, a couple of years recently um, that uh, I thought well you know I, maybe I've just worn this out. Maybe I uh, you know maybe I've done my last sketchbook and uh, it was just getting to be kind of, I mean, I was still drawing every day and going through the same emotions, but it, I didn't seem to have the uh, same attachment. And then uh, the last several months, I mean, I'm, I'm back at it with uh, as much zeal as I had 20 years ago. So. And what is the lesson in that? Uh, don't, <laughs> don't give it up. You know, when I, when I said that uh, it was absolutely uh, uh, an important part of my uh, personality and my survival, uh, I realized that at, at one point when I thought I was going to uh, uh, not do it for a while that uh, that was a severe mistake, you know, because I seemed to, to uh, I got my world kind of started to uh, waver a little bit. So. I found in talking to hundreds of artists over the years that uh, almost every artist gets stuck. 
-hmm. Almost every artist goes through a period of sometimes a year or two years where right. they, they feel like walking away from it. I was recently in New York with a very famous artist and he, he said to me, I can't do this anymore. Mm. And he said, what advice do you have for me? And I said, just keep doing it. Yeah. And even though you don't feel work, like doing it. Work through it. And he worked his way out. But along the way, and I hear this a lot, is once they get stuck and they work through it, there's usually a breakthrough. Did you have a breakthrough of any kind when you... Yeah, I think so. I think so. And the breakthrough for you was you were re-enthused about your work. Yes, because, uh, you know, uh, looking at me, you know that I've been doing this for a while, so I, my first um, thought was uh, I'm just getting a little older and maybe that's, it comes with the territory, you know, uh, but I did work my way through it and uh, there, was, there was a time when I went, you know, am I going to get through this? Am I ever going to be excited about it again? And, uh, you know, sure enough, you know, here, here I am, uh, you know, just chewing at the bit to draw another uh, sketchbook page, you know, so. So, uh, some young artist is viewing this right now and looking at the depth of your work and saying to themselves, I don't know if I can ever get there. Hmm. What do you have to say to them? Well, I, I, I will say that uh, I don't look at what I do today uh, any different than I did when I was first starting. I didn't feel it was very good. I still, th I, I won't say I don't feel it's uh, not you know adequate, but it's not as good as nearly as good as I would like it to be. So, uh, the distance from where I thought I was uh, 40 years ago and where I thought I was, uh, where I think I am now, from how good I want to be, uh, is the same spectrum. It hasn't changed. So when somebody, you know, I see somebody that, that goes, will I ever be as good as you? And I'm, I'm thinking, will I ever be as good as somebody else? You know, so it's, uh, it's all relative, you know. Uh, I think the, the real um, death knell for any artist is to think, boy, oh, I've really mastered this and I'm just going to do this uh, like this for the rest of my life and because uh, there's nothing left for me because I am at the top of my game, you know. Well, once you get the per perfect game of golf, why keep going, right? Once well, you've had something perfect and... I would have no incentive to do it. So. Right. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's the challenge that keeps us going. I the one think. piece of advice that I would give to somebody starting out is to set a very realistic goal for yourself. First of all, have a space, a place and a space where you can kind of leave your stuff on the table because physically putting it out of sight is, a, is a, a good idea for your wife or your significant other that wants the place tidied up. But uh, in terms of uh, a working artist, uh, it's really nice to know you're gonna go there, it's setting out, and all you gotta do is pick up a pencil and start drawing. Uh, the second thing is, is make a very, very realistic uh, uh, goal of how long you're going to draw every day. And I mean, realistic. Five minutes is a realistic goal. So, and pick a time. Uh, for me, it's the first thing in the morning uh, before I do anything else. Uh, before I look at my, well, I look at the time on my phone when I get up, but before I check messages, before I do anything else, before I look at my computer, I start drawing. And usually I don't even look at my computer till like 10.30 or 11 o'clock. Why? Why? Why do that? Well, you're going to do more. You, you just have to put yourself in the situation to do that. Right. And I don't think there's ever been a day I only did five minutes. You know, that's, uh, but do you, do you feel as though if you don't do it every day, you, you lose some of that mind-hand coordination? Do you feel like you lose the rhythm? Or is it just because you need to be in a constant state of practice? You do, you do, you do lose, you do, you lose a little bit of that, uh, you know, that connection, uh, and it's uh, not exactly like riding a bicycle, you know, it's, uh, uh, I mean, Van Cliburn's the guy that said, uh, you know, if I don't uh, practice for a day, uh, you know, I know it. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting, we had uh, Max Ginsburg in here one time, yes, uh -huh. you know Max, mm -hmm. and Max is, uh, quite a bit older than you are, and he's been painting for a long time. There's somebody older than me? Okay. Uh, just only one. <laughs> and uh, maybe maybe two. Um, and 
and he said, I practiced for five days before we shot the demonstration video. And I said, Max, you, you know, you've been painting your whole life. Why did you do that? He said, because if I don't paint for two days, I completely lose it. I need to, yeah. you know, I have to constantly be practicing. Yeah, to I'm the same. I'm exactly the same way. I practiced before I, I came down here. So. so that's a lesson for everybody, really, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. Just constantly be doing it. And that's probably true for anything, guitar, piano, uh, but certainly for drawing or painting. Well, I for, I've forgotten where I heard the story, but somebody was sitting by somebody on a plane, and they saw this guy, and he had his eyes closed, and his fingers were moving. And uh, I said, what are, you, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm, I'm giving a concert, a piano concert, uh, and I haven't played this piece for uh, a few weeks. so. I just wanted to play it a few times before I got there. You know, so. so, are you doing that in your head when you're driving, or when you're, uh, you know, you're you're not drawing? You know, I fixate on drawing and fixate on art and fixate on uh, on, on, on beauty in the world, and uh, <laughs> I blank everything else out. You know, if I'm uh, heading to uh, get an egg McMuffin, you know, I might find myself like two miles down the road, uh, going like, what, what was I doing? Where was I going this morning? You know, because I've I've started thinking about, uh, you know, some project I'm working on or, or, or a painting I want to do or a painting I'd like to have back because uh, I saw it on the wall and it looked terrible, <laughs> you know, all those kinds of things, you know. I mean, I go to people's houses and, and uh, they, they own my work and I'm like, when they go out of the room, I, I kind of want to go over and like smudge something or move something, but uh, you know, I don't. I, I restrain myself. I do straighten the pictures up a lot. <laughs> so. If you had an opportunity to, to spend time with one of the great masters from the past, uh, who would that master be and what questions would you have? I think it would be uh, Albert Durer, uh, who uh, was not somebody that I was uh, uh, really fascinated with early on and not, uh, certainly not my favorite artist of all time, but uh, I'm very curious about his mind because uh, he has a book called The Painter's uh, manual, and uh, there's ab absolutely nothing in there about painting uh, the way that a uh, modern day painter would think about painting. Uh, there's nothing about paint, there's nothing about the chemistry of colors, there's nothing about brushwork. They're all geometric theorems, and they're very, very, some of them are very complex spirals and, and uh, uh, nautilus and, and what have you. And uh, uh, I would just like to talk to him to try to figure out just what made him tick and, and how his mind actually worked because uh, he was uh, certainly meticulous in a very Germanic way. Well, and a, and a brilliant draftsman. And a brilliant draftsman, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that rabbit is, is absolutely very fascinating. Absolutely. <laughs> well, this has been a pleasure. I'm honored that you would come in and do this with us and um, uh, it's really been wonderful to get to know you and I think you're an inspiration to us all. Um, I think that uh, your work will live on for thousands of years. Oh, and, that would be wonderful. And um, so this has been a real pleasure to know you. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. I hope you've enjoyed this segment with Michael Mettler, both the interview and the segment of drawing. It's a terrific learning instrument. If you want to learn more, you can go to lilyartvideo.com. See you soon. I'm Eric Rhodes. Have you ever gazed in wonder at the beautiful figure drawings created by Botticelli, Caravaggio, Michelangelo, or Da Vinci, and thought to yourself, I'd love to be able to do that. There's no doubt that learning how to draw the human form is a priceless skill for any artist because it's the foundation of all art. But what if you can take it to a higher level? What if you could master the drawing techniques of the old masters? The key is having the right mentor to help guide your hand and give you principles to simplify the process. Michael Mentler has been called a modern-day Leonardo da Vinci. His drawings and sketchbooks are priceless masterworks. Master artist Michael Mentler's teaching skill breaks the drawing process down into easy-to-understand steps. 
So you want to do this exercise with some gusto. It's called gesture for a reason. Uh, it is not called find the line of action or find the posture or find anything. It's called gesture and gesture means exactly that. You're trying to get the action in relation to the pull of gravity. In his all new exclusive instructional video, world-class figure artist Michael Mentler shares his step-by-step -step approach to creating stunning figure drawings in the Renaissance tradition. You'll discover how to work with the forms that make up the human body, how to establish the correct proportions of the head, arms, torso, hips, and more, the secret to drawing the head from multiple angles, and how to draw features like the eye sockets, cranium, cheekbones, mouth, and nose. You'll also learn how to use a wireframe to draw the human body from multiple angles, how to use gravity, light, shadow, and movement to your advantage, how to tap into your intuition, giving yourself the freedom to grow and learn with each drawing you create. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I hope it's a big benefit to, uh, to your pursuit of, uh, of your career and uh, whatever your uh, goals are as an artist. Whether you're a complete beginner or an experienced artist, this all-new training will help you discover how to master the skill of creating beautiful figure drawings with a Renaissance flair. This is a skill that will serve you for years to come and give you the foundational principles to draw the human figure with elegance and fill your sketchbooks with masterful drawings. Figure drawing in the Renaissance tradition with Michael Mentler is now available on video. Reserve your copy today.